So I've been remaking awards-winning animations for around a year now, and also work at a web agency where we focus on creative animations. And what I've realized is that most of the animations that we see out there are always made with the same techniques. There's this rule called the 80-20 rule, or the Pareto principle, that specifies that 80% of the consequences comes from 20% of the causes. And that's essentially the pattern that I see when it comes down to web animations. It's just a few repeating techniques that comes back over and over to make some crazy nice animations. So I wanna take a look at the top five and some bonuses. So the first technique that I use all the time and that's used all the time in the industry is the scroll tracking. It's essentially a technique where you track the progress of the scroll for a certain portion of the page. And a lot of time that returns you a number between zero and one, which you can then transform and use to create some fancy animations. And there are many, many tools to help you do that. Uh, a couple of ones that I personally like is the scroll trigger by GSAP and also the use scroll hook by Frame Emotion. I really like those two personally, but there's a small problem with these types of animations that are linked to the scroll. And it's that a lot of times when you have a mouse and you kind of scroll on your wheel, it's not gonna be smooth, right? It's gonna be a bit jammy. And so since your animations are linked with the scroll, they are also gonna be a bit jammy. And so what I like to do and what most studios like to do is to use a smooth scroll and that way your animations are gonna be smooth. And the most popular one is the Lena scroll but you can also use something like the locomotive scroll, which I personally like. And it's essentially based on the land scroll as well, but it adds this layer on top of it that can help you create animations. And now the second technique is the viewport detection. And I'm willing to bet my life that every single award-winning website uses some kind of viewport detection. And what I mean by viewport detection is basically when you have an element that enters the viewport and you want to trigger an animation at that point, then that's what I call a viewport detection, right? And honestly, it's just a must no tool because like 50% or most of your animations are made when it enters the viewport. So it's a must no tool. And the classic way of using that technique is with the intersection observer API. But personally, I like to use either GSAP or Framer to do that instead of directly using the intersection observer API. And those functions, usually they are the scroll trigger by GSAP or you can also use the use in view hook by Framer Motion, but they all use the intersection observer API in the back end. So I suggest you take a look at that if you're interested. And now the third technique is the sticky position. And that's probably the easiest technique out of all that is listed right now. And that's because it simply uses the CSS sticky position. And even though it's easy, in my opinion, it's absolutely OP. It's easy to set up and there are no weird bugs or things that you wouldn't expect because it's a native functionality and it's supported in every single browser. But the problem with that technique is you have to think outside the box if you want to create some nice animations without it being obvious that you're using the CSS sticky position. But honestly, it's used everywhere and you would be so surprised to see how many animations would simply not work or would simply be super buggy if the CSS sticky position did not exist. So you have to check it out. But yeah, all in all, the sticky position, in my opinion, is top tier in the list. And if you master it, you can create some crazy and super satisfying animations. And now the fourth technique is the easing. Now it might sound a bit boring because it's not officially a technique, but the easings are becoming the most important part of a website to master if you want to give a certain feel to your website. You know, some website, you see them and they just have this feeling to them. And a lot of time, I believe the easings have a lot to do with them. It sets a vibe, it sets the mood of a website. For example, you could have something that's very slow or something that's very fast or something that's bouncy and that gives it all its character and all the vibe to the website. And I don't know for you guys, but I'm personally seeing the rise of motion design in website development. It was already there, but now it's becoming like really obvious that it's now part of web development. And so I think mastering the easings and just motion design technique in general is just becoming something that we have to master. And then also I'm seeing some websites and I can tell some websites are amateur and some other websites are professional because they master those motion design concepts like the easings. And the fifth and last official technique is the text splitting. Now it might sound a bit weird, text splitting, but I'm telling you this technique is crazy. Essentially what I mean by text splitting is for example, you have a paragraph, then you can split that paragraph into lines 
and then you can split even more that lines into words and then words into characters if you want. And that basically opens up a ton of potential animations that you can make with typography, right? Because we're destructuring our paragraph and that way we can now animate the characters or the words individually or the line. And that's also a technique that I'm willing to bet is present into every single words winning website. Now, if you want, you can split your paragraphs by yourself. It's not that hard, but I personally like to use the GSAP module called split text. And if you don't have it, you can also use the library called split type. And also we have to be careful with this technique because since we're splitting our paragraphs into lines and then lines into words, etc., it can be really bad for accessibility if it's not handled well. And also it can create some really weird bugs if we don't handle, for example, the resize events and things like that. So we have to be careful with this technique, but I think it's just an amazing technique that opens up a bunch of like a huge range of potential animations that we can use with type. And so I had to put it on the list as just an animation that is used over and over into every single website. And now I wanna get into some bonus techniques that might be a bit less used than the other ones, but to me, the other ones are really obvious. And so these techniques are a bit more subtle in my opinion, and they are techniques that I started using. And since then I can't really stop using them. And so first we have the map function. And what I mean by the map function is not like the array.map, but the mathematical map function. And it's just such an amazing tool. I've started using it and now I just can't stop using it. Like if we remove that from the code, like I'm, f that's how much I'm using it. And basically it transforms a value, a range of value into another range. And so for example, if you, if we go back to like tracking the progress of the scroll, it returns you a value between zero and one. And so you can transform that range into another range that you can then use for scaling or translating or like an opacity, things like that. And also there was another use case um, that I needed that recently that was really useful is for example, to um, transform or convert some pixel values, for example, in a pointer, like a mouse event that you want to convert into like a Cartesian space or Cartesian uh, values, for example, in WebGL. And so you would use that math.map function. It's just so useful and you can use it vanilla. It's also inside GSAP and it's also inside Firma Motion. In Firma Motion, it's the use transform hook has a different name and yeah, it's in every single animation library because it's such a useful tool. And also you can put it inside of your CSS if you want, it can create some crazy stuff with that too. Okay. Then we also have the lerp or the linear interpolation. And I also love to use that function. I don't use it a lot outside of the request animation frame, but when I use the request animation frame, I just use that all the time to create smooth animations. For example, when I create a pointer, like a cursor animation, I use the lerp a lot. I also like to use it inside of the canvas API because I use the request animation frame a lot inside of those animations and you can create like some smooth interpolating between shapes and you can play with colors, things like that. And yeah, there are just many, many cases where we can use that function. And I just love it for that because it's a one liner quick like that. I love it. And now the final boss, the final technique is the shader. And to me, that's a must know technique if you want to create any kind of experimental animations. They're not often used in commercial websites, but some websites that are trying to be artistic, sometimes they will want some fancy animations that we can create some really unique ones using a shader. And also many, many websites that use 3D inside of the awards, uh, they have some kind of shader with like either vertex deformation or some fragment shader to add like some little spice. A lot of them use it. I think it's really nice. It adds like a new dimension to things. You have to think differently when making a shader. And I think it's so interesting. And since it's a bit hard, there are not a lot of libraries as of now that helps you do things for now. I think it's going to come soon, but for now there are not a lot of libraries. And so really to me, it's an open field that allows, and that opens up a lot of opportunities if you're interested in that. And it, you can really create your own things that no one else has ever seen or has ever done before. And so to me, that's a super interesting technique, even though it's not used a lot and it's a bit like overkill or like too experimental for a lot of cases. I think it's super interesting to dig in that, to create some crazy fancy animations. And yeah, that was my list of the most used animations in the industry. I basically use all of those tools to create all of my animations. There might be a few here and there that I did not mention, but I'd say those tools are the ones that I use every day to make the website that I make. So if you learned something, if you like this video, leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.